About a year ago this time, I was invited to lunch by John McGinty and Bob Newton, both executives at D.C., and they asked me to uh, consider uh, editing uh, what is now a, a newspaper, the C-21 Resources, Encountering Jesus and the Scriptures. I did it with my colleague at New Testament Abstracts, Chris Matthews. There are copies of this uh, on the table at the door. I highly recommend it if you, if you don't have it already. Um, in it, we have about uh, 10 or 12 articles on various aspects of the New Testament, but uh, especially under the heading, Encountering Jesus in the Scriptures. Uh, what I want to do this evening is uh, to speak about the infancy narratives. There's a very fine article on the infancy narratives in this by Barbara Bow, which I would highly recommend. I'm going to do something different from what um, she does, but she can give you a, a good perspective on how to interpret these texts, so I would highly recommend that. The church in the 21st century also decided uh, that they would um, not only publish this newspaper, but also that they would schedule a series of lectures on the topic of encountering Jesus in the scriptures. And if you look at the inside um, back cover of the newspaper, you'll find um, a rather ambitious and quite remarkable series of lectures on various aspects of Jesus and the scriptures. Uh, and this evening, we end the series. Uh, this is the final part of it. But if you, if you look at the schedule, which began in September or so, and has had uh, probably about eight or ten different lectures by very distinguished speakers, uh, you'll see what an, an excellent job these people have done in uh, using this as an educational tool. One of the things that hasn't been done is what I started to do last week. That is the theme of encountering Jesus in the Old Testament scriptures. And uh, last week what I, I did basically was I took some of the Advent texts from the book of Isaiah and paired them up with the New Testament texts in which they are associated in the liturgy of Advent and was especially interested in the issue of promise and fulfillment. There the emphasis was in the Old Testament texts. And what we saw is how the early Christians, and in fact the church's tradition through the centuries, has found Jesus in the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, particularly with respect to the dynamic of promise and fulfillment. There I also mentioned Augustine's comment that the New Testament uh, lies hidden in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament becomes clear only in the New Testament. And that was sort of the dynamic. What I want to do this evening is, if you look at your handout, um, I say one of the ways in which early Christians encountered Jesus was in the Old Testament scriptures. This examination of Matthew chapters 1 and 2 and Luke chapters 1 and 2 will focus on their Old Testament backgrounds and will give particular attention to the distinctive approach taken by each evangelist. This evening I want to do two things, basically. I want to show how these infancy narratives that we find in the beginning of Matthew and the beginning of Luke are shot through with Old Testament allusions and Old Testament quotations. In order to understand the infancy narratives, you have to have some feel, some um, a sense of the Old Testament. The second point I want to make is that um, we often blend together the two New Testament infancy narratives. That's not necessarily a bad thing. There was um, a movie that appeared a couple of years ago, uh, um, ago called Nativity. It's a rather good film. Uh, one of the things it does is it does blend Matthew and Luke. What I want to emphasize this evening is that each of these evangelists has a different agenda and a different approach to the infancy narratives. So I want to help you to look at each of these infancy narratives on its own so that you see what the evangelist uh, uh, was trying to say with these infancy narratives. So uh, two things then, how the infancy narratives are shot through 
with Old Testament allusions and echoes and quotations and so forth, and also how each of these two evangelists has a distinctive approach to understanding the infancy narratives. Now, if you look at your handout um, on the back of the first page, we have the Gospel according to Matthew. This is um, Matthew chapters 1 and 2. And as I said, what I want to do is to emphasize the Jewish um, Old Testament backgrounds and also the distinctive uh, perspective that Matthew the Evangelist uh, brings to the infancy narrative of Jesus. If you look at your outline on the first page, you'll see Matthew's infancy narrative uh, is concerned with two questions, the who and the where. Chapter 1 is concerned with the who, that is, who is Jesus. It uh, tells about his genealogy and then about his birth, or at least conception. The second chapter is concerned with the where. First we have Jerusalem and Bethlehem, then Egypt, then Bethlehem, and then from Egypt to Nazareth. So who is Jesus and how did he get to Nazareth, basically, is what Matthew is primarily interested in. So let's start with uh, Matthew chapter 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 1. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The uh, aim behind this genealogy is to make a link between Jesus and David and Abraham. David and Abraham, of course, were two of the great heroes of the Old Testament. And what Matthew, in his genealogy especially, wants to do is to root Jesus in the history of Israel, and particularly to make a tie between Abraham and David on the one hand and Jesus on the other hand. If you look at chapter 1, verse 17, that is the end of the genealogy. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon uh, to the Messiah, 14 generations. 14 is 7 times 2. 7, of course, is an important uh, number in the Old Testament scriptures. And what Matthew wants to emphasize is a certain um, uh, proportionality, if you will. He wants to link um, Jesus to Abraham, David, and the exile. And he sees this uh, salvation history unfolding in a kind of purposeful way as a result. Now, if you look at chapter 1, verses 2 through 6a, you have from Abraham to King David. This is the first segment of these three segments in the genealogy. Where did Matthew, or whoever is behind this genealogy, where did he get this kind of material? You can find all these names in First Chronicles chapters 1 and 2. So in other words, they're already in the Hebrew Bible. What is striking here in this first segment is that it gets interrupted by the inclusion of several women. Several women of uh, at least uh, dubious um, history. And what happens, I think, is uh, it inserts the idea of preparation for the surprising birth of Jesus. Let's look at this first segment, chapter 1, verse 2 through 6 a. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez, Zerah by Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Amran, Amran the father of Aminadad, Aminadad the father of Nakshon, Nakshon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. This um, genealogy then proceeds from one generation to another, and it's very um, rhythmic in its, in its uh, unfolding and its uh, highly structured. But the structure is interrupted at uh, three points here. First by Tamar. Tamar in Genesis chapter 38 uh, dresses up as a, uh, a prostitute and gets a child by her father-in-law. 
Um, Rahab is a prostitute in Jericho who helps out Joshua and Caleb in the first two chapters of the book of Joshua. Um, Ruth is a Gentile woman who attaches herself to the family of her dead husband and uh, th then becomes an ancestress of King uh, David. Uh, the idea is that these women, these three women, uh, it's unusual that women would be included in this kind of a genealogy, somehow or other prepare for the surprising birth of Jesus from Mary. So you have to know something in a sense about uh, each of these figures to appreciate better perhaps uh, the enormous claim that is being made. Let's look at the um, second segment uh, from David down to the exile. David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Uriah, of course, was um, the soldier, uh, Uriah the Hittite, whom, um, who was married to Bathsheba. Uh, David wanted Bathsheba for his own, and so he made a plan to get Uriah killed. This is not David at his best. Uh, again, we get uh, a, uh, an unusual appearance of um, a woman here with an unusual background. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, Abijah was the father of Asaph, Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, Joram the father of Uzziah, Uzziah the father of um, Ahaz, Ahaz the father of uh, Hezekiah, Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Amos, Amos the father of Josiah, Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. All of these figures are described in the books of Kings, especially second Kings. With the exception of two of them, Hezekiah and Josiah, they're a motley crew at best. Uh, it's a pretty dismal tale. These were not, at least in the eyes of the biblical writers, uh, exemplary kings. One of the points that um, Matthew's genealogy makes is that the ancestors of Jesus are indeed a motley crew. There's all kinds of different people in it. Uh, there's saints and sinners, there's scoundrels, uh, and there's good people. Uh, so, um, the effect of the genealogy then is to uh, relate Jesus to Abraham, to David, and now to the exile. Beginning in verse 12. After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Saaltiel, Saaltiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, Abiud the father of Eliakim, and so on and so forth. We only know about the first two or three of these figures. We know about Jeconiah and Saaltiel and Zerubbabel, but after that, down to Joseph, we don't know much of anything. Finally, in verse 16, we come to Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Uh, it is through Joseph that, uh, at least legally, Jesus becomes a son of David. And so uh, he, he then fits in the royal lineage. So all the generations were 14. 14 from Abraham to David, from David to the exile, from the exile down to uh, Jesus and his um, birth. Now, what's the point of the genealogy then? Uh, it's uh, uh, an attempt to root Jesus in the history of his people Israel. It reminds us the, that the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah are a mixed group of people. Uh, in the Christian tradition, Matthew's Gospel has been placed first for several reasons, but at least one reason is it provides a kind of nice transition from the Old to the New Testament. And this is one of Matthew's special interests. He's interested especially in Jesus as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. One of the things that um, Matthew likes to do, both in his infancy narrative, but also in um, the body of the gospel, and again, especially in the uh, 
passion narrative is to use what is called formula quotations. All this took place in order that this scripture might be fulfilled. We have a nice example of this in chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Here we have the account of the uh, conception and the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, and she was found with the child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place in order to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from the sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. The major figure in Matthew's infancy narrative is Joseph. Uh, in Luke's infancy narrative, Mary is a major figure, and Joseph is uh, something of an afterthought. Joseph, of course, in the Old Testament is the dreamer. He has dreams that, uh, when he e explains that to his uh, 11 brothers, offends them deeply, uh, because he's going to be the most important of them all. At any rate, Joseph is the dreamer. Likewise, the New Testament, Joseph is a dreamer. Uh, a second point, the name given to Jesus uh, is a form of Joshua. In the Old Testament, Joshua, of course, is the successor to Moses, and he becomes a very important figure in the early history of Israel. The name Joshua, in its various forms, uh, means the Lord saves. And in a sense, the name of Jesus then, while a fairly common name in Jesus' time, uh, in a sense, it also uh, expresses his mission. His mission, of course, is to be the Savior. Uh, and so he is to be the Savior of his people. The third point that I want to make here is the fulfillment quotation. The quotation here is from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Uh, Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel. The 8th century prophet Isaiah, whom we saw last week, um, <clears throat> seem to have prophesied uh, that a child who was to be born from the time of his king, and his king would have been Hezekiah, uh, would be uh, God with us. Uh, in the Old Testament, as we saw last week, you get a lot of unfulfilled prophecies. Early Christians were convinced that this Isaiah text from the 8th century BC must have been talking about the person of Jesus. The idea of the uh, virginal conception seems to be found both in Matthew and Luke, suggesting that it's already a very early tradition in Christianity. And one of the uh, proofs, if you will, or one of the um, backgrounds of this is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. There's all sorts of things you could say about this particular text, and perhaps we can get into them later on. But the fundamental points I want to make are three. Joseph the dreamer, Joshua, Jesus, the savior of his people, and the um, fulfillment uh, quotation from the book of Isaiah. Now, if you look over on the um, uh, chapter 2, so far we've seen Jesus uh, rooted in Israel's history. And we've seen that in order to appreciate him, in order to answer the question, who, you have to have some sense of a lot of these Old Testament figures. The second question that comes up in chapter 2 is where? How did Jesus get from Bethlehem to Nazareth? Well, they took the long way around, as we'll see. Uh, 
The first episode, again, all of these episodes are concerned with answering the question, where? The first episode that's familiar to you all is the Magi episode. This is chapter 2, verses uh, 1 through 12. And it takes place first in um, Jerusalem, where the Magi come and um, visit with Herod the Great. And then it takes place in Bethlehem, because that's the place that the Messiah is to be born. So let's see some of the details here. Again, what I'm interested in is uh, the Old Testament echoes, backgrounds, quotations on the one hand, and the distinctive perspective of the evangelist Matthew on the other hand. At the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men, or magi, from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its uh, rising, and we have come to pay him homage. The Magi uh, could well have been um, Babylonian astronomers, Persian priests, or spice traders from uh, the Arabian Peninsula. We're not exactly sure where these people come from. They do come from afar, and obviously they're not Jews. One of the important things is at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, Gentiles, non-Jews, come to visit Jesus, the child. At the end of the Gospel of St. Matthew, in chapter 28, verses 19 to 20, Jesus says to his disciples, the risen Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the nations. In other words, they go out to all the nations. In the infancy narrative, all the nations come to Jesus. At the end of St. Matthew's Gospel, they go out to all the nations. The star at its rising. Uh, one of the prophecies of the Messiah figure in the Old Testament comes with a pagan prophet named Balaam. Uh, and what Balaam uh, is hired to do by the king of Moab, an enemy of Israel, is to prophesy against Israel. And yet, try as he might, he can't do it. And he, and he kept saying uh, wonderful things about Israel and about its future. In one of his prophecies in the book of Numbers, chapter 24, verse 17, it, it is that a star shall arise out of... Uh, Jacob. And uh, again, there's something going on here between the star and Balaam's prophecy and the birth of Jesus and the star um, pointing him out. The Magi say, according to chapter 2, verse 2, they have come to pay him homage. The Greek word here has the sense of to do him obeisance. And um, as we'll see as the story uh, proceeds, Herod says he wants to pay this child homage. Actually, he wants to kill him. Uh, and this theme, if you look at uh, the end of verse 8, uh, Herod says that, that I may go and pay him homage. And if you look down in verse 11, what the Magi do is to pay him homage. So the Magi come to Jerusalem in search of where the Messiah is to be born. They're told by Herod's court, if you look at chapter 2, verse 5, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the um, rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. This is from the Old Testament book of Micah. And here the uh, prophecy is that Jesus, or uh, the Messiah Jesus, will be born in Bethlehem. And so the... Magi come to Bethlehem, pay him homage, and go back by another route. They bring gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There's, there's an echo of this in Isaiah chapter 61. What I'm saying here, again, is that this text, as all of these texts, are full of uh, Old Testament allusions, and in the middle of the text, a formula quotation from the Old Testament book of Micah. And again, what Matthew wants to do is to give you a sense of a preview that Gentiles come to the child Jesus. At the end, uh, the risen Jesus sends his disciples out to all the nations.
Um, another theme that is developed here that is going to pl play out in the body of the gospel is the theme of conflict. As we'll see in Matthew's infancy narrative, there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of danger, there's a lot of conflict. The point is that the shadow of the cross is there from the beginning. So in ch chapter 2 then we're interested in the where. If you look at um, verses 13 through uh, 15, uh, Joseph has another dream. He's told to bring the child to Egypt. And if you look at uh, the end of that in chapter uh, 2, verse uh, 15, uh, that they were to remain there until Herod was dead, this was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. This is from the Old Testament prophet Hosea. And the son in Hosea is the people of Israel. Of course, here we have another fulfillment quotation. The son here is uh, understood by Matthew and his first readers, presumably, as Jesus, the son of God. In a sense, this is an important um, uh, contribution to our understanding of who, um, who Jesus is. In a sense, he's the incarnation or the personification of the people of God. So the, the place in this episode is Egypt. The next place is, verses 16 through 18, is uh, Bethlehem, the so-called slaughter of the innocents. And again, what is, is being emphasized here is that uh, somehow or other this fulfills the scriptures. If you look at chapter 2, verse 18, a voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. This is Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. And again, you get a formula quotation. Finally, in uh, verses 19 through uh, 23, how does Jesus get from Egypt to uh, Nazareth, which is in Galilee? Nazareth is in um, the northern part of the land of Israel. Judea and Jerusalem are in the southern part. Again, Joseph is warned in a dream, and he's told to uh, go to uh, Nazareth uh, in order to fulfill, if you look at the very end of that section, he will be called a Nazarene. People argue about what exactly this Old Testament quotation is, one of the most uh, prominent interpretations would make it um, a link with Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, the stump from the root of, of um, Jesse. Okay, uh, what's the point here of Matthew's Gospel? Well, he wants to emphasize the uh, Old Testament Jewish background of the person of Jesus. He wants to root him in Israel's history. He wants to introduce a lot of conflict, tension, and uh, danger, pointing forward to what is going to be the mood, in a sense, of Jesus' public activity. And he wants to make the point, and it's a very simple point, that as Jesus was as an adult, so he was as a child. Uh, if you read the um, biography of, pra pra of practically any famous person, and if it, if it starts with the person's childhood, the um, biographer will invariably point out the roots of uh, this person's interest in his childhood. So as he was an adult, so he was as a child. Okay, what I'd like to do uh, now is to turn to the second of these, that is Luke's infancy narrative. And again, if you look at the first page of the handout, you'll see at least the outline and get a sense of what uh, Luke is trying to do. If you look at the outline, what Luke is obviously trying to do is to make a comparison. And the comparison is between John the Baptist and Jesus. And so we have at the beginning of um, Luke's infancy narrative, announcements of birth. The announcement of John's birth and the announcement of Jesus' birth. 
Then we have the episode of the Visitation and Mary's Song, what we call the Magnificat. Then we have uh, another comparison. We have um, the birth of John and the rituals surrounding the birth of John in chapter 1 verses 57 through 58 and chapter 1 verses 59 through 80 and then we have the birth of Jesus and the ritual surrounding his birth and then we in the uh, infancy narrative then we get the finding in the temple in chapter 2 verses 41 through 52 what Luke wants to do is to say John was great Jesus was greater still so John's birth was remarkable. His, the, uh, the announcement of his birth was remarkable. But uh, the announcement of the birth of Jesus is even more remarkable. Likewise, uh, the birth of John and the rituals surrounding it were quite remarkable, but the birth of Jesus and the rituals surrounding it are even more remarkable. So he wants to emphasize uh, the greatness uh, of Jesus without uh, saying anything negative about uh, John the Baptist. John the Baptist prepares the way. The tone and the mood of Luke's infancy narrative is quite uh, positive, even romantic. It's uh, uh, a beautiful story. For most of us, it's the Christmas story. and we sort of fit the pieces in from Matthew's Gospel. But if you read it on its own, it is certainly a beautiful account. Let's put it that way. Now, in Luke's Gospel, you have it here on your sheet, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we have what's the prologue or preface to Luke's Gospel, in which he explains uh, how he worked and how he wrote the gospel and for whom he's writing the gospel. It's all one big sentence in Greek and it's a very elegant sentence. It's uh, obviously from the hand of somebody who knows classical Greek very well and uh, who wants to show how, how good he is at writing classical Greek. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. There's all sorts of interesting details here that I could go into, but my only point is this. Uh, this is a kind of elegant, sophisticated uh, expression. As I said, it's all one big sentence. Now, look at uh, chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. He's writing in a very different style here. This is the style of the Old Testament. The very style in which he writes, uh, he, he wrote this uh, in Greek, but it's the language and style of the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. And by changing style and by writing what could be called biblical Greek what he's doing here is setting the mood the mood is um, uh, ancient Israel it's Israel in history and the uh, characters that he wants to speak about Zechariah and Elizabeth Joseph and uh, Mary uh, Anna and Simeon all of these represent the best piety in ancient Israel's piety. In other words, these are sort of ideal figures. Ideal figures in the sense of their integrity, their honesty, their devotion, and so forth. So um, the style, there's, the medium is the message here. In other words, he wants to say something about these figures as representing the best in Israel's history.
Now, the uh, story of the uh, announcement of uh, John's birth follows pretty much the same outline that we're going to find in the announcement of the birth of Jesus. And it's a familiar outline from the Old Testament. You find uh, similar progressions, for example, in the book of Exodus and the call of Moses. You find it in Jeremiah uh, chapter 1, the call of the prophet uh, Jeremiah. Uh, let's begin in, um, let's see, um, the people are at uh, prayer, Zechariah is doing his priestly duty, he's taking his uh, turn in the temple, an angel appears to him, greets him, and uh, uh, there's a kind of encounter between the two, and he has a rather startling thing to say. He says in verse 13, the second part of verse 13, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong uh, drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, with the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents and so forth. In this uh, brief compass of several short verses, uh, some very important points are being made about uh, John the Baptist. One element is that it, it, there are echoes of the story of the birth of Samuel in the Old Testament in the book of Samuel, chapter 1 and 2. There are echoes of the story of the birth of Samson, he will never drink wine, in Judges chapter 13. There are echoes of Elijah. In fact, Jesus, um, John the Baptist is said to exercise a ministry of preparation, as Elijah was supposed to do. So the commission, if you will, what uh, is being said to Zechariah is in terms of these great Old Testament figures and Old Testament characters. Now, in these uh, stories of vocation or announcement of birth also, oftentimes the subject makes an objection. Zechariah's objection is, uh, we're too old to have a child. Uh, and uh, <coughs> the angel reaffirms the commission or uh, the promise, you will have a child, and the sign is that Zechariah will not be able to speak until the child is born. So you have greeting, initial confrontation, commission, objection, reassurance of the promise, and then the sign. Look at uh, chapter 1, verses 26 through 39. This is the announcement of the birth of Jesus, and the, uh, the angel comes and uh, greets Mary in verse 26. Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Well, she's puzzled by this, and she's told, do not be afraid. In verse 31, she gets her promise or her commission. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. Now, uh, this is a higher rank, as it were, than John the Baptist. John is to be called is is called to be an Elijah figure who prepares the way for the Messiah. Jesus is uh, said to be the Son of the Most High. In uh, um, Mary objects, how can this be? And then uh, the angel goes on to say, uh, the child, this is in verse uh, 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy. He will be called Son of God. And the sign is going to be the fact that Elizabeth is going to have a child. And Mary's response is, here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. Again, the same fundamental structure, a structure found beforehand in the Old Testament, that is the greeting, the confrontation, the commission or promise, uh, the objection, the um, reassurance, and the sign. And 
what's being said here is, and what is um, most important is John is great, Jesus is greater still. John is the Elijah, Jesus is the Messiah. In fact, he's more than the Messiah, he is the Son of God. In um, verses 39 through 45, we have the episode of what's called the visitation. What is striking here is that Elizabeth, the older woman, uh, refers to Mary as, blessed are you among women, and refers to as the mother of my Lord. In other words, the older woman is uh, deferring to the younger woman, precisely because she's deferring to her child. Mary's response is the famous hymn that we call the Magnificat. If you, uh, the, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. One of the great passages of the Bible. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, Hannah, the mother of Samuel, says similar things. In fact, uh, Hannah's song is, in a sense, the Old Testament model for Mary's song. And the emphasis here, basically, is the great reversal that has taken place. These insignificant people, uh, all of a sudden, are going to become very important people. Now, in the second part of um, Luke's infancy narrative, we have the stories of their births. First John, and then Jesus. Uh, this is chapter 1, verse 57. Now the, tame, the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard uh, of this, uh, that God had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. So. Uh, John is born in the usual human way, presumably. And uh, there's great rejoicing over this uh, unexpected and quite remarkable uh, um, event. Um, the ritual they go through is the naming and the circumcision of John. And uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth somehow or other have decided that the child's name will be John, and people are surprised at that. But once the name is given to the child, uh, Zechariah opens his mouth and is able to speak again. So the uh, sign, as it were, has come to fulfillment. What does Zechariah say? If you look at chapter 1, verses uh, 68 to 79, this is the famous hymn called the Benedictus. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Now what's striking about this hymn is that it's more interested in Jesus than it is in John. In other words, you would expect Zechariah to be so focused on his own child, but he's not. If you look at um, verse uh, 69, He raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. John is not from the house of his servant David. Jesus is. So the one being celebrated, first of all, in Zechariah's hymn is Jesus, the Messiah, uh, the descendant of David. If you look at verse 76, And you, child, will be called prophet of the Most High. This is John the Baptist. In other words, he is, again, the Elijah figure who comes before uh, Jesus. Uh, according to verse 80, John was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. What wilderness was he in? Uh, it would be the Judean desert. If any of you have had the chance to go to Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, it's probably in that area. And in fact, a film that they show at uh, Qumran makes a lot of John once upon a time having been a member of that group. There's a, there's a, a, a lot of dispute about that and we, we need not go into it here. But it, it was an area that uh, attracted a lot of religious energy at the time. Now we come to the birth of Jesus. And again, this is a familiar story to you and I, I uh, simply want to um, make a, um, a few points here that um, go along with this evening's theme. They end up in Bethlehem because there's a census from the emperor. Uh, 
And this is how Jesus comes to be born in um, Bethlehem, which of course was David's ancestral home. He, however, is born in humble circumstances. There was no room for them in the inn, and so he's laid in a manger. In uh, verses 8 through 14, shepherds uh, are in the fields, and they're the ones who see all of this. The angel says to them in verse 10, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy to all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. Now this is full of Old Testament language, but there are also some new terms here. The good news and Savior. Uh, these are terms that were being uh, used at this time of the Roman Emperor. There's a kind of comparison going on here under the radar. Uh, the Emperor may be great, but this child is greater still, despite his humble circumstances. We're told, according to chapter 2, verse 19, Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. One of the things Luke does is to define what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. He does so usually in terms of uh, uh, one who hears the word of God and acts upon it. You find this in chapter 8 and also chapter 11. Who best embodies that discipleship? It's the figure of Mary, as she's described in the infancy narratives. The final point, uh, the ritual John undergoes is the circumcision and the naming. Jesus presumably undergoes the same, but he also undergoes the presentation of the child and the purification of the mother. There they meet up with these two elderly figures, Simeon and Anna. Again, these two people represent the best of Israelite piety. They're, they're what the Old Testament points to. These are the best figures you could imagine. Simeon, uh, seeing the child, uh, says in, this is chapter 2, verse 29, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. In verses 30 to 32, practically every phrase can be found somewhere in the book of Isaiah. In other words, Simeon is speaking Isaiah language. And the point is basically that this child is the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel uh, as stated in the book of Isaiah. The other figure is called Anna. She's uh, an elderly widow. And uh, it, we're told in verse 38, at that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. So... Uh, uh, Simeon is looking for the consolation of Israel, and um, Anna is looking for the redemption of um, Jerusalem. But part of the prophecy of Simeon in verse 32 is a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Luke's telling us from the infancy narrative on, Jesus has significance for all the nations of the world. Luke is also the author of the Acts of the Apostles, in which he describes the spread of the gospel all over the Mediterranean world. So, uh, when we look at Luke's infancy narrative, what does he want to emphasize? Well, he wants to emphasize some of the, th the same things as Matthew did. As Jesus was an adult, so he was already as a child. Jesus fulfills God's promises to Israel. Uh, what is perhaps most striking by way of a difference between Matthew and Luke is the tone. Again, remember Matthew's tone is, if especially in uh, chapter 2, there's a lot of conflict, a lot of danger. Whereas Luke's tone is much more positive and much sunnier. Um, Matthew's gospel is kind of cloudy, Luke's gospel is kind of sunny, at least in their infancy narratives. So what I've tried to do this evening is to at least point out, first of all, how uh, 
the language of both infancy narratives is thoroughly biblical and it's, it's expressed in a way that makes the point of Jesus roots in Israel and at the same time his significance for all the peoples of the world. Secondly, I've tried to emphasize uh, how each of the evangelists has a slightly different take, interested in different characters, making different points that then get developed in the body of the gospel. So thank you for your attention. We have time for questions and observations.